Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. And uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome uh, Kevin O'Meara, who is the uh, vi Senior Vice President for Supply Chain Effectiveness at Breakthrough Fuel. And uh, prior to that, he was the uh, uh, Senior Director of North America Logistics uh, Operations at Whirlpool. Uh, I've known Kevin for a long time. Uh, always a, a pleasure talking to him and, and uh, uh, you know, wealth of experience and a wealth of ideas. So I'm, I'm very excited to have him on, on the program. And uh, you know the cherry on top, but he's a he's a, uh, a Cornell grad just as like like I am. So uh, that's always another uh, added benefit. Um, you know, before we uh, get started with the conversation here, I just want to remind everyone uh, that you know part of our goal here at Talking Logistics is to make this interactive and have you, the audience, also participate in the conversation. So if you've got any questions for for Kevin as we're kind of talking through some of these issues and and trends in the supply chain logistics industry, go ahead and, and uh, submit them via the submit a question button. And I'll keep an eye on them, and uh, if we've got time, and I'll try to weave them uh, into the conversation. Um, so with that, uh, uh, we'll get started. Kevin, uh, thank you for uh, making time to be on the program today. Well, thanks a lot for having me, Adrian. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's a great, great venue you have here. So congratulations on this. Great, great. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been fun and exciting so far, and uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, enjoy the, uh, the opportunity to speak with uh, executives such as yourselves. Uh, so, so let's before we get into uh, kind of talking about uh, you know some of these different industry trends and topics. I always like to ask uh, you know my guests you know how they got involved with the industry. I, I, you know I usually joke that you never hear a kid say you know I want to be a supply chain executive when I grow up, and uh, you, you probably don't hear many uh, you know high school students or college students say that for you know say the same thing for that matter. Um, so you know tell us a little bit about you know, your career path and, and how and why you got interested in supply chain logistics and uh, what you're currently doing today. Yeah, I think, uh, thanks Adrian. I think uh, you're absolutely right. I don't think you hear, well, certainly didn't hear it much when I was uh, coming into the field. Uh, I think you hear it a little bit more now, thanks to some great programs at, you know, um, or uh, colleges like Penn State and um, Michigan State and places like that that have really made this into a, great field that people aspire to get into. Um, from my perspective, it really all started, I was at, at, as you said, at Cornell. And as you can probably remember, Cornell is not the uh, least expensive uh, university in the country. And so I went through Army ROTC to pay for the college tuition. And that put me into the Army and where I spent my first 13 years of professional life uh, in the Army. Uh, and um, we, you know, what I learned there was quite a bit about logistics because as I think we've all heard that uh, the Army runs on logistics. Uh, I think if you go back and study the history of logistics, which is kind of a hobby of mine. Uh, supply chain group uh, within the within the army called the quartermaster corps uh, and i had the opportunity to run warehousing and trucks and uh, all the different things that we do today in the civilian world all throughout europe uh, during the late 80s and early 90s when there was still in east germany and west germany and things like that uh, and it just fascinated me i mean the, the capability to move product to pre-position product to uh, identify, you know, pre-positioned demand needs and what, what the demand needs were. All the things that we do every day get done in the Army, you know, tenfold. When you, when you move things, you move, uh, you know, you move cities basically around. Uh, one of my final assignments in the military was to run the Port of Rotterdam before the first Gulf War. And so, you know, again, just a massive logistics effort. So, that's what got me interested in it. That's what got me excited about it. And then from there, just have continued to uh, add more and more exciting challenges. I did a lot with the service parts area within the within the automotive group uh, and uh, worked with Ford and General Motors and places like that. Obviously, as you mentioned, Whirlpool. And now I'm in a very interesting role because what I'm doing now is we're taking a slice, if you will, of the supply chain, which is becoming so critical, and that's the energy supply chain. Uh, and what I mean by that is all the 
companies that are doing all sorts of shipping and supply chain work, uh, what, what, they'll, what they find out is energy now, and specifically fuel and mobile energy, uh, is becoming a huge portion of their cost structure. It's some, in some cases up to 40% of their cost structure. And so from that perspective, we help people, I'm um, helping people manage that and be able to deal with that and not totally disrupt their supply chain because people didn't plan for 40% of their supply chain cost to be energy and certainly it's getting more expensive. So um, that's what I've been, that's what got me here. That's what got me excited about it. Um, you know, it's just, it's in a really, really exciting field. And quite frankly, I think one of the things we find now is companies compete on supply chain. Um, you know, if you, many, many retailers out there, if you go from store to store, a lot of the competition is around shelf availability, shelf space, uh, how quickly can they replenish, um, all of the quality issues that exist. The, the product is the same. You're buying, you know, a detergent or whatever you're buying in one store to another to another. The product's the same, but where they compete on is supply chain, which makes it really exciting. Yeah, no, great, great, great point. I mean, and, uh, you know, the, the fact that you got started in, in the armed services and, and that being a kind of a, a, a starting point, if you will, for Korean logistics, um, I think is uh, is a common one for for a lot of folks, uh, particularly like like you yeah. said. I mean that's such a core competency of the armed forces. I mean, and you know provides you with so many of the skills that you need to be a successful you know logistician out in the uh, civilian world. Um, so, so I think that's a that's a great story. Actually, I think you wrote a guest commentary on our blog in terms of uh, America's greatest talent pool. You know our veterans. And the, uh, even just in the past uh, you know, year, you've seen a number of different companies announcing initiatives to, to hire veterans uh, overall. And I think it's a, certainly a, a, a great talent pool. You know, speaking of a, you know, one of the topics we've talked about a lot here is a talent shortage in the industry. You know, there is a definite uh, you know, potential to tap into this great pool of talent you know, coming out of the, um, uh, the armed services. Um, yeah, let I, think, me, uh, I mean, go ahead. No, if you don't mind, I'll just. much uh, in terms of leadership and technical skills when it relates to um, uh, to to supply chain and logistics it, I think it is a great talent pool that people shouldn't shouldn't uh, ignore great yeah ab ab absolutely so let, let's um uh, kind of dive into some uh, you know a, a number of different topics that I know uh, number one is, is uh, areas of interest to you and areas that you have got a lot of experience in and the first one is, is transportation management and, and what's happening, you know, in, this, in the industry with regards to capacity, with fuel, with rates uh, and things like that. Um, you, you've written on your blog that shippers need to take emotion out of the uh, equation and really, you know, spend time analyzing the, uh, the data trends and performing detailed cost analysis to make, you know, well-informed strategic and, and operational, uh, you know, decisions. Um, you know, what's your assessment of the state of transportation in the U.S. today, particularly in, in trucking? And, you know, should shippers be concerned about, a, you know, potential driver shortage and the changes in hours of service and, and other regulations? And, you know, what does this all mean in terms of the way shippers and carriers work together or ought to work together? Um, yeah, I think, you know, from a transportation perspective, there's a couple things going on. Um, first of all, you definitely have a contraction of capacity. I mean, there's no doubt about that. You have, you have driver short, you know, shortages or driver issues. You talk, talk about people not wanting to grow up to be in supply chain necessarily. People certainly don't grow up, um, you know, aspiring to drive a truck. And that's unfortunate because it is a great career. and We have great people doing it. Uh, however, there is a contraction in that space. I think the carriers in general have contracted the size of their fleets a little bit, um, but it's but but the rest of the world hasn't stood still. And what I mean by that is, 
you know, you have an expansion, a pretty dramatic expansion in the rail capacity and in the rail in an intermodal capacity, which has helped take up a lot of that. In fact, you know, if you look way into the future, you could envision a time where virtually all of the long distance point to point movements are done on the rail and then trucking is really the short haul, you know, 200 mile around the rail hub type thing. But I mean, it'll take a while for that to occur, but, but in general, um, you have these other dynamics going on. So I think when I say about data and making sure you watch data, there is one story, which is capacity contraction, no doubt about that. But there's a whole nother story going on in the demand in the demand side. And the demand side of it, you have the intermodal, you know, just pure replacement intermodal and rail. A lot of boxcar is starting to come back, people moving things on boxcar. Um, uh, which, of course, every boxcar that moves, if you take an 86 foot boxcar, that's essentially, you know, rough estimate about three uh, trailers, three trucks off the road. So you start moving that and you start replacing pretty fast. The other dynamic going on that a lot that I've written about a lot, and I think is something that people need to keep an eye on is, of course, the miniaturization of things. Um, I joke a little bit about the fact that uh, my stereo in my house now is my iPhone and a tiny little job, you know, jawbone speaker. Um, now that that little component, which is probably you know that size, when you add them all together, replace something that you know could barely fit on this desk uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, T televisions are another great example where, uh, quite frankly, now it's hard for someone shipping televisions to even build a truckload because they're so small and they're so valuable. You just wouldn't, you know ship them in that quantity. So you have miniaturization going on, which is a lot of demand destruction, if you will, uh, taking demand out of the out of the network altogether. And then we all have seen and read about uh, and, and written about this whole idea of 3D printing. I mean, who would have imagined that um, that soon, and quite frankly, now for certain things, but soon you will send specs over the internet uh, to a location that's very close to you that will actually create the item you're looking for in a 3D printer. And so that starts doing some demand destruction as well. And then finally, you have just the total elimination of certain products. I mean, um, think about CDs and, uh, and books and those types of things that used to get shipped all around the, all around the world, all around the country. I mean, it's don't even exist anymore. You download them and, and you get them. So, you have to look at both sides of that dynamic. And what I come out with, the, when you look at both sides of that, both that dynamic, um, it's fairly balanced. And I think that uh, as more and more issues that might, might occur with the, with the capacity side, I think, quite frankly, the demand side is going to move a lot faster in terms of reducing demand because of all these different um, kind of macro macro trends that are occurring. So I think that's one, one piece that, that we, we want to look at when, when we look at this. Uh, secondly, I think that loadability in trailers becomes a big, a big deal and that helps with demand. More and more of the work that I've done uh, over the last few years has been, how do I just get more stuff on a trailer? How do I design the product? Literally upstream, get into the design uh, portion of what a company is doing, go upstream and make sure that product is designed for loadability into into conveyances that that can that can move it. So uh, I think that will be a big deal. So that's from my standpoint what I see. Uh, I know there's you know some folks have written and continue to write about the world's going to come to an end when hours of service get put in place, or the world's going to come to an end because drivers are just going to not exist anymore. Uh, but quite honestly, I've heard those exact same comments since 1992, and it hasn't happened yet. Uh, not something shippers should ignore. Shippers should absolutely keep their eye on it. However, I would say that they ought to keep their eye, make sure they keep their eye on the other piece as well. Right. So, um, how did, you know, in, um, in, yeah, yeah I, I was going to say, you know, in light of all, all these trends you're talking about, I mean, I think ultimately when, when you, you know, it comes down to when a shipper and a carrier sit down at the table, right, to kind of renew their their contracts or the, discuss rates or things of that nature. Um, in light of everything you said, you know, 
how does it change or what's the approach that shippers and carriers ought to be taking when they sit across the table to each other? I mean, you know, we always like to talk about it's a shipper's market or it's a carrier's market and the pendulum keeps swinging one way or another. And and I think the, the elusive goal for many companies has always been, you know, can we try to smooth that out a little bit? And I think that's been kind of, it's been an elusive goal. Um, you know, can carriers and shippers kind of get to a point where it's, you know, we're not talking about a shipper's market or a carrier's market, but things get smoothed out a little bit more? Yeah, I, that's a great question. And I would say it depends. Um, and I think, you know, large shippers should think about it in this way. Small shippers will be a portion of it. Um, but the way you have to think about it, in my mind, is there are multiple supply chains within most companies. There are supply chains that lend themselves to spot market, uh, very transactional, one day it's up, one day it's down type, type purchasing of transportation. Then there are supply chains that really lend themselves to incredible consistency and incredible levelness. And in, and in those particular areas, far more collaboration and information sharing is absolutely critical uh, that, that you do that. So I think you got to look at what part of it you're in and, and where you want to stand. I, I agree with partnerships and I agree with collaboration, but it's not the answer to everything. It's not, it's not what you do for everything. Uh, so, for example, um, I would say that if you're in, a, in an environment where you're going to do a special movement, you're going to do some special, special movements or something, those may be something that you just transactionally do. Uh, you complete it, uh, it's done it the most efficient way, and you're done with it. Then there's replenishment, let's say, to store shelves and those types of things. Those things have to be very, very consistent, have to be very, very reliable. And, and you're not going to want to change things in and out all the time because people, there's a lot more knowledge there than just driving a truck from point A to point B or moving a train from point A to point B. Those have to be highly collaborative, highly, you know, high partnerships. Um, I, I find it very interesting when we talk about shippers market and, uh, and you know, um, the transportation provider market when we swing back and forth, because quite frankly, that language is used in both sides. I've heard shippers use that language. I've used that language before, but I've also heard high level executives of major transportation companies use that language. And I think they do it at their own peril, because quite frankly, that reinforces the idea that this is just a commodity. If you just say, hey, if demand is up, then prices are going up. And if demand is down, then prices are going down. And that's just the way it is then what you've done is said, hey, this is a commodity and it's gonna behave like a commodity. And so live with it. Uh, I don't believe it is a commodity. I believe it's, you know, at certain, at certain points in the supply chain it might be, but at most points it's not a commodity. There's a lot more to offer than just driving a truck from point A to point B and, I, B. and I know you've had people on that have talked about big data and all the data streams that come out of it, which is not the least of which is a huge value here. Um, so from that perspective, I think people have to, you know, segment their supply chain, find out which parts they need to be very highly collaborative with, which parts they don't need to be highly collaborative with, and then, and then uh, work with it from there. One other item I'd like to point out is transportation is a very interesting, um, uh, especially the trucking side, a very interesting industry because it's one of the few industries where you actually have one person for every machine. Usually you invest capital and it's a capital versus labor discussion. In trucking, it isn't a capital versus labor. You buy a machine, i.e. the truck, and then you have to hire a driver to put in that truck. And so it doesn't lend itself so much on the front end to scalability. And what I mean by that is, and what shippers have to understand is, someone can talk in general that the market's over capacity or the market's under capacity. But you got to dive in and say, where does my product ship? What lanes am I, is my supply chain heavy on? And what's the status of, of the industry in those particular areas? So for example, uh, if you're a heavy shipper going to the West Coast, very rarely is the, is the market over capacity. Um, uh, have, very rarely does the market have, uh, excuse me, very rarely does the market have too much demand. It almost always is over capacity. And however, if you're shipping off the West Coast and you're trying to do that 
you know, in October or September when uh, people are stocking up for holidays and everything, then yeah, absolutely. The market is dramatically uh, over demand and under capacity. Uh, so you got to really get into the micro level to understand the transportation situation for your supply chain. Yeah, those are you know great points uh, all, all around, especially the last one in terms of understanding the you know the the local um, you know uh, demand and capacity uh, situations. You know, you, you hear a lot about you know moving freight in and out of Florida or Maine, you know, in states like that, where again, you know, that's going to be very different than if you're trying to move stuff out of you know the port of Long Beach uh, at certain times of the right. year. So. Um, you, you know, you brought up uh, kind of to shift to the next topic, which is sustainability, and, and you uh, kind of talked a little bit already about, um, you know, companies looking at packaging, right, and, and being able to, you know, fit more products per case, more cases per pallet, more pallets per, uh, per truck um, as a way to, you know, kind of increase the load utilization or just to take trucks off the road. And, and in many cases, you know, that's done you know, the packaging side, you know, it's done for both, you know, cost savings at the packaging level, it's done for cost savings at the transportation uh, level as well. And one of the, the benefits of that, obviously, is, is sustainability, because you're taking trucks off the road and, and, and so forth. Um, the, more broadly speaking, there seems to be, you know, growing interest in this topic in the transportation field, particularly with alternative fuel vehicles, such as gas or electric vehicles. And we're seeing a number of different shippers and carriers um, you know, experimenting with some of these vehicles, introducing them in certain parts of their uh, network or certain geographic regions. Um, you know, um, and even in the railroads, you know, BNSF just a, a week or two ago kind of announced that they're going to be pilot testing uh, natural gas powered locomotives. So um, a lot of activity going on here. What do you think is driving, you know, this this activity in, in alternative fuel vehicles and alternative energy? Um, and uh, do you think, uh, it's important for supply chain executives and for companies to understand the, the carbon footprint of their supply chains. Um, you know, to date, I really haven't seen many companies kind of use that kind of information to influence their supply chain decisions, which still tend to be driven more by, by you know, other cost factors and, and balancing that with service level requirements. But, but what are your thoughts on that, on, you know, the, the, the role of carbon footprinting, sustainability and supply chains moving forward? Uh, so I gotta, I gotta talk about what, uh, I gotta separate out what I want to happen and what is happening because, uh, I do believe very, very strongly in sustainability. And, uh, and so, uh, some people, uh, might say I'm a quote tree hugger or, uh, that, that type of thing, but, but I, I'd say a, co a couple things to sustainability. First, it, it is going to happen. I mean, this is one of those things where I remember four years ago, uh, I talked to a large group of folks and I said, look, we're just, all we're arguing about is when fuel will be three, four or five dollars a gallon. We're not arguing about if it will. And, and, you know, I think the same is true here. We're not really arguing about when will sustainability questions come into play, I mean, if it'll come into play, we're, at, we're arguing about when it will come into play. When is the right time to make that investment? You know, you know, you know how far ahead of the game are you gonna get those things? If you go to Europe and you look at major companies in Europe that are leading this, this trend, I mean, they know their sustainability footprints down to, you know, all the three different scopes of sustainability, scope one, two, and three, and they know uh, exactly what the greenhouse gas emissions are for their products all the way through the supply chain. And that is going to come to the United States, my opinion. But I'll give you an example. If you go to Google and you go to Google Finance and pull up the financials on, uh, on a company now, you'll actually see, if you look, you'll see a greenhouse gas uh, emission score. And that score identifies how much they've reported how well they've reported and what the report actually says. And then, and then how much upstream are they gonna go with their suppliers for that, uh, for that reporting? Uh, so this is a core topic, it's going to happen. I think the, there may be still a debate about how much is man-made, how much is just nature, uh, but the, the earth is warming and that's not a good thing for us and we have to, we have to try and fix that. So that's maybe a little bit more of my opinion on it. But uh, let's talk about what's happening in natural gas. I think 
executives absolutely do need to know what's going on with alternative fuels and specifically natural gas. Uh, I think for two reasons, it's one of the only times, you know, or one of the few times that it exists where you can do a great thing for the environment and you're going to save a lot of money. Um, you know, natural gas is, you know, on a diesel gallon equivalent, two bucks diesel gallon equivalent cheaper than diesel. And quite frankly, it's not as, it's not as, um, reactive, if you will, to the price of the feedstock because the actual cost of natural gas when you get it in a, let's say a compressed form for a CNG, the actual cost of that, most of that's made up in the fixed cost of distributing it in terms of compressing it and moving it and those types of things. Very, I, only about, I don't know, 20 or 30% or so is made up of the actual, um, the actual gas itself. So if the gas itself goes up in price, the cost to the to you doesn't move as much. Whereas in diesel fuel, it's, it's a, you know, the feedstock of crude oil is substantially more as part of the cost. So as crude oil goes up, then the, uh, then the cost, uh, the cost that you see go up pretty dramatically. So from a cost standpoint, it makes all the sense in the world. From an environmental standpoint, I mean, clearly it, it, it provides much better from an emission standpoint. Uh, it is something that people are looking at and transforming pretty, pretty quickly, I would say, into it. Uh, and we, you know, I, I talk more and more to folks that want emissions reporting. They get it. They're probably not at the level of detail. If you look at the greenhouse gas protocol and you get into scope three emissions and how to actually do that type of reporting, I don't know if people are quite there yet, but they're moving there uh, pretty rapidly. And the demands coming from a variety of reasons. One is government. I mean, we know that the government is pushing for this, and we have now our first, call it cap and trade exchange going on in California right now. Um, and of course, Europe's had the European uh, exchange for a number of years. Um, so, you know, the government's pushing it. I think the consumer is pulling it through. Consumers are much more interested in how products get made what the impact is to the environment and what the impact is to the environment when that product gets disposed of. Um, and then thirdly, I think shippers are very interested in it because obviously they see economics and they see some cost savings uh, when it comes to doing that. Interestingly enough, the transportation industry itself uh, is getting pulled by the shippers along. And that's one of the functions of this kind of fuel surcharge programs we have in the United States, where essentially the fuel is paid for uh, by the shipper. So if fuel prices go up, it just gets passed on to the shipper. So it's the shipper who's going to pull this through, not necessarily, uh, you know, the transportation industry that's going to create it. Yeah, no, all great points. I mean, I, I, you know, the way I see it, you know, there's been so much discussion on sustainability. I mean, going back almost a decade now, I remember when Walmart um, kind of made its announcement, I think going almost a decade ago, there was so much, you know, they made the headlines, you know, for about six months there, just about every trade magazine, even business magazines had sustainability and green and everything else going on. And seemed then the kind of the economy took a tank in 2008, late 2008. And so yeah. in, in yeah. Kind of uh, everyone was tightening the belts and focusing on, uh, uh, you know, just riding the storm, if you will. But, you know, I really believe that there is, uh, you know, again, growing, you know, momentum here. I think a lot of companies are still trying to figure their way out. I think a lot of companies are still kind of at that first stage in terms of just trying to measure where they are to try to create a baseline. Um, but, but I think be between the different factors going on in terms of what's happening on the energy market, what's happening with regulations, what they may be already be required to do in Europe, as you said, and things of that, things like that. I think the needle continues uh, to move here. And again, from a transportation standpoint, I, I really see a lot of the activity taking place there with, you know, the likes of UPS and FedEx and Ryder and, and, and so on and so forth, really kind of introducing these kind of vehicles into their operations and in, uh, as part of their fleets. And, and a number of shippers, as you said, shippers actually bringing kind of creating that demand saying, hey, can we take a look at this and see where it makes sense in our operations? Um, yeah, and I think um, I think two, two other points that I would make. Uh, the first is a very interesting thing that's going on that doesn't get as much press from a sustainability standpoint, but it should, is there's a 
dramatic increase in fuel mileage going on with diesel trucks. And of course, the best thing is don't burn the fuel, don't burn any fuel, right? So the more you get a fuel mileage increase, that is not only a cost savings, not only good for everyone, but it's also a sustainability benefit because you're just not burning as much fuel. Uh, so I think, I think that is a, is a big portion of it. And then the second piece from a sustainability standpoint that probably doesn't get as much press is just network design and network redesigns that go on. So how do you make your network? A lot of companies have grown by acquisition. And if you really look at their network, you'll find that it's kind of a hodgepodge of things that have been put together over time because they bought companies and they had these. But, in, but if you can rationalize those networks and really minimize the miles driven, that again is the best thing you can do for sustainability is just not even move, not even move the vehicle. Yep, yep. Well, let's uh, move on to another topic that's been getting a, a lot of buzz you know, over the past couple of years, and that is you know, a number of, of companies bringing their manufacturing operations you know, back to the, uh, to the United States. Um, you, you know, based on your experience, I mean, what are some of the, the supply chain factors that will lead a company to kind of decide to, you know, reshore, you know, the manufacturing operations? And are, are there situations where keeping manufacturing in China or Mexico or, or, you know, overseas, you know, makes sense versus, you know, bringing it back? Um, and I guess finally, I mean, I, considering the fact that we've been, you know, offshoring for so long, are we even prepared, you know, to, to bring all that manufacturing back, even from a, even a, a labor pool standpoint or a talent standpoint, or even our transportation infrastructure, you know, can, can we handle, you know, much manufacturing coming back? Yeah. Um, three points I would make about that, because it is, it is happening, probably not as much as the hype has been happening, but, but it is, is going on. And a couple things I think have changed. One is, the thought process around best cost sourcing versus least cost sourcing. And that's a pretty dramatic change in thought process. I think when the massive rush to, uh, to, to offshore manufacturing was done in a time when people looked at very small components of the overall supply chain, i.e. the manufacturing portion of it. And when I say small, I know that's big, but I mean small in terms of a whole supply chain is they looked at that and said, the cheapest place I can get this done, this activity done, is overseas. And so off, they, off we went. Now it's much more about what is the most efficient and lowest cost way I can get a product to market and get it on the shelf available for a consumer to buy it. And that's best cost sourcing. That means that some portions of the supply chain may actually have an increase in cost so that other portions can have a decrease in cost the, and efficiency, and that brings, uh, brings you the best core. So I think that's first and foremost, more and more people I talk to that are in the decision points of these types of things, they're thinking more around best cost rather than least cost. The second thing is we have had an interesting group of, uh, I would call supply, well, supply disruptions over the last few years. You know, we had flooding in Thailand, we had the nuclear problem in, in Japan, had a couple wars. Um, you know, there's been all sorts of things that have gone on, which, have, which has raised the uh, awareness of risk mitigation and, and risk in supply chain. Um, you know, people have realized we might have been wound a little too tight, if you will, in terms of the supply chain. And as soon as the winds got too strong or the rains got too hard in certain areas of the, of the world, the supply chain just stopped and it just stopped. And from a risk standpoint, which goes into every decision you make, you always have to put the risk part in. Um, people, I think, have looked and said, you know, uh, we may be a little too risky here uh, to certain things that we just can't control. So I think that's the second thing people are looking at. And then the third one is this whole dy dynamic around uh, energy costs in the United States. I mean, I think that as the United States becomes more and more self-sufficient from an energy perspective, people are seeing that you can bring things back and the trade-off, the costs of reduced transportation, because you're not paying all the movements over the dramatic reduction in actually running the factory in the United States. And then, of course, 
just sheer less miles of distributing it out to the to the final uh, to the final location. That is, um, you know, that's kind of said, hey, we got to start bringing this stuff back to the United States or maybe near shoring down down to Mexico, which I think has become big, you know, certainly in the automotive world. Um, that that I think those are the three big factors of of why it's happening. Now, one thing I will say is, don't expect a massive uh, employment gain on these things because one of the things that's happening is these factories come back is they're so automated. Um, and another gentleman had written a post about what it, I think it's called here come the robots or something like that where where you can run these giant, especially if you're building new today, if you're going into a greenfield operation today, you can build these giant manufacturing plants with very little folks in them. Uh, and so that's an interesting piece of it. Now you, you had asked about when um, when does it make sense? You asked when does it make sense offshore? It truly is that best cost decision, I and mean, that's what you have to do. I, I I think I think what people are are learning, and maybe this is relearning something that was known many years ago, is there is more there's more value than maybe people have given credit for in terms of doing localized manufacturing. Build it where the product's going to get purchased. And that, and the reason why is people are putting more value on risk and, and really looking at that risk piece and also flexibility. If you think about it, if, if we all know demand and demand is tough to predict, even the best people in the world have a tough time predicting demand. Um, and you need to be able to be agile in that perspective. It's awful hard to be agile when you lead, when you lead time is 45 days or 50 days or 100 days. It's awful hard. If, if you're closer, you can be a lot, lot more agile. So, yeah, those are those, um, those, that's what I see is going on. Yeah, yeah those, those are all you know great points. I mean, I I, I hadn't quite heard it uh, put uh, you know best cost versus least cost. I like that uh, terminology and, and way to kind of looking at it. And uh, certainly, risk management is is an area that I hear a lot of uh, folks talk about in terms of you know driving their decisions to you know take a second look at their supply chain networks and and where they're sourcing product from or building product. And, uh, you know, the energy piece, you know, uh, I think is, a, is an interesting one as well. You know, the robots, I mean, that's one of the um, uh, predictions that I made back at uh, for, for 2013 in terms of, you know, it's seeing increased use of, uh, you know, robots and automation in, in supply chain. I, I remember back when I worked at Motorola, you know, one of um, uh, the objectives that we had in the group that I was working in is we were trying to bring back, this was in semiconductors, and a lot of semiconductor assembly you know, package level assembly was done in Asia. It's still, you know, for the most part, it's still done in Asia. Um, but we wanted to bring some of that to the U.S. to be Apologies there. I think uh, I lost the signal there for a second. Can you hear me okay, Kevin? Yep, I'm fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, yeah, it seems like I, I went blank there for a second. Well, just to wrap up what I was saying, um, you know, one of the, uh, when I worked at Motorola, we were trying to bring some of the assembly operations that we had over in Asia back to the U.S. to be closer to our customers. And uh, the way we, we try to do that was through, you know, highly automated, you know, uh, systems. We think this was back in the early 90s. We didn't quite you know, succeed back then, but I suspect that with the uh, state of automation today, uh, we're certainly seeing that more and more uh, as kind of the strategy to be able to, you know, compete from a cost perspective, um, you know, uh, you know, with Asia and some of these lower labor uh, cost regions. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that uh, yeah, I've got a couple of two or three more questions here that if you do have a question for Kevin or, or a comment for Kevin, you know, just submit it via the submit a question comment as we're kind of getting close here to, towards the end of our program. Um, you know, Kevin, kind of shifting gears now and, and talk a little bit about uh, supply chain, uh, you know, social media. Um, you know, a lot of uh, supply chain executives that I talk to are very skeptical about social media. I do a lot of speaking around this topic and give a lot of, uh, you know, workshops. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks still 
you know, skeptical about it, aren't not using social media. You, on the other hand, uh, have been using social media for some for some time. Uh, you've got your own blog, uh, 10X Logistics, which I, I follow and, and read. Uh, you're very active on, on Twitter. Um, so my question is, you know, why do you blog and why do you use Twitter? And do you think it's important for supply chain executives to to use social media and, and for what reasons? Well, I think um, I, the answer, short answer is yes. I think it's really important to use it when used properly. And I think you've made this comment, and I've quoted you many times on this, is, you know, most people who don't use social media think of Facebook. That's what they think about when you say uh, you want to use social media. And of course, you know, I would argue, I think most people would, that that's probably not the place to exercise a lot of business work uh, uh, there. But, but from a social media, but if you use it properly, meaning very targeted, very professional, very key about your, your uh, you know, whatever industry, whatever, whatever you happen to be doing, I consider it kind of open source information and an open source sharing. And as I've said, it's really important that you get different perspectives on a sort of talk supply chain specifically on supply chain, especially if you're a person who's been in a particular industry or in a particular company for a long period of time, you can get very isolated in terms of how certain things occur. And your mind can get open pretty widely if you interact with a lot of different people that are in a lot of different positions. Um, around, you know, around the industry. I think um, get a lot of information, a lot of ideas. Uh, it's amazing the type of ideas you can get. And that's what I use it for a lot is I will get these quick little blurbs of information, which will then spark my mind to say, well, I want to research that more. I want to understand it more. Certainly you're not going to become an expert by reading a 140 character tweet and say, okay, uh, I now know that topic. But what it's going to do is trigger something in your mind that says, boy, I've heard that three or four times now. 3D printing is a perfect example. I didn't know, I, I wasn't sure what people were talking about, but I started seeing it over and over. And I said, let's find out what this is. And then you do some more research and you find out, wow, this huge supply chain impact uh, to, to our industry and to certain, certain companies uh, by using that. So, that's an example where that occurs. And then there's just a lot of professionals out there yourself. Um, you know, I know Kevin O'Mara, the other Kevin O'Mara, he does quite a bit and he's a very uh, smart individual that are sharing ideas and concepts that if you're isolated and you're not participating in that, then, then two things are happening. One is you're being very isolated about what's going on in your particular world, in your particular company. And chances are the network of friends you have are people that are just like you and think just like you. And that's, and, that, and so that's why I use uh, social media a lot. I use it a lot. Now, you've got to take some time up front to filter it and understand what you want to read, what you don't want to read. If you just blast this thing open, you're going to see and hear a lot of things that have no bearing on anything. But, um, but I think it's, it's a good use of it. So, you know, I think, um, I think it's something that people ought to be very, very aware of. I would say finally about it is if you, let's say you're, I won't give it away, but let's say you're my age, perhaps a little bit older than, uh, than the average person, uh, I can assure you your employees are using it. And I can assure you your employees want to use it and they're going to use it. And there's probably not a lot you can do about it. I've read a lot of companies will block Twitter and Facebook or whatever, they'll block all these things um, on their network as if they don't think, as if they don't think their employees have um, a smartphone sitting right next to them and they're doing it anyway. So just doing it on their smartphone. So what's the point? You know? uh, yeah, no, so great, great. That's what I think you're going to Yeah, no, no, great. I, I think you, you, uh, uh, you echoed a, a a lot of good points that I hear from other executives for doing it. It's really, you know, a path to or another medium to learning and to networking with with peers and and, and others in in the industry, um, and a way of finding out or keeping a pulse of what's happening um, in the industry or in, tre in different trends in technology and, and business processes, uh, uh, so on and so forth, and really exposing you to you know different sources of knowledge uh, and information. So. You know, whereas in the past you might have relied on, 
you, you know, magazines or, you know, more traditional forms of media, you know, now, you know, this is just uh, uh, kind of the more modern way to keep a pulse of, of, of what's going on and, and to learn. And I, I think if you, if you have a, a commitment and an interest in continuously learning and keeping a pulse of what's happening, and, uh, you know, social media could be a very powerful way to do that. But like you said, you know, you, you've got to kind of experiment with it, learn how to use it effectively so it doesn't become kind of this information overload that then you're flooded with, you know, a lot of extraneous, you know, uh, stuff that has nothing to do with your interest or with, um, you know, what you're looking to get out of it. Um, I, I, kind of, I tell people, I, I tell people that if they think it's just a bunch of 10 year olds or 12 year olds just playing around, just remember this one idea, which is the revolution in Tunisia was essentially planned over Twitter. So, you know, it's a, it's a very powerful tool. Absolutely, absolutely. So kind of last couple of questions here. So, so as you look at your kind of crystal ball here um, and look out into the future of, of supply chain and logistics, you know, what excites you the, the most about, you know, what's going on in supply chain and logistics and, and perhaps what concerns you the most? Um, well, what excites me about supply chain logistics, I would, I'll, I'll highlight two big areas. One is there's no lack of challenges and issues to deal with. So uh, from that, if you're, if you just get adrenaline rushes like I do in solving, you know, fairly big and complex problems uh, and working with teams, both virtual and, uh, and, uh, and local teams, um, you, you there's just a lot to be done, and there's going to be continued a lot, a lot to be done on it. I think the second thing that really excites me about it is that people are starting to realize that supply chain is core to what they do. Many, many companies now that 20 years ago would have said, oh, we just outsource that, outsource that, outsource that, are now saying, you know, core to what we do is the whole customer fulfillment operation of which within customer fulfillment is the value chain, which includes most of what we do in the supply chain area. So it's becoming kind of core and you're starting to see people that have made a career in, in supply chain and logistics now becoming CEOs of companies where those positions would almost always come out of sales and marketing 20 years ago. They're now starting, you're starting to see a lot of chief supply chain officers take those types of positions which means that companies more and more are realizing that's core to what they do. I think the key one, you think about Apple uh, and, you, and, you, and you think about the transition there, it was the operations guy that kind of was elevated uh, uh, to the position after uh, Steve Jobs left. So, you know, it, it's just a very, very exciting time. And if you're young and new and just getting into the industry, uh, I think you're coming into a phenomenal industry because of all those all those things. Um, I think some of the things that are challenging that you know the, the generations today and future generations are going to have to address. Uh, one is energy. Energy is clearly a challenge, and it's a challenge from a whole variety of different prospects around how much is it going to cost, what's the availability of it, what's the type of it. Um, but mobile energy is a critical component of the supply chain and it's not going to go away as a topic of consideration. And for all shippers, you know, they got to understand they're buying all this mobile energy because of the way surcharge is working. And they're buying all that mobile energy. And if they don't understand that 40, 50, 60% of their cost is actually purchasing energy, then I think they're going to, they're going to have an issue. So, so from my perspective, that's one big exciting topic. Obviously, as you would expect, given what I'm doing, that that's a that's an exciting topic. Um, I think more and more of this, um, uh, how would I call it? I'll call it, for lack of better terms, demand destruction. Around, I, I think more and more about how products are actually made and how they are distributed are going to change with technology. Localized, very very localized and very very specific manufacturing for a specific thing you need is going to happen at some point for a lot of products. An example I've used before. So just think of, a, of an environment where if you think today, most things are done as batch processing and those types of things. But you think about today, um, if you wanted to buy uh, a computer mouse, you wanted to buy that product. Today, 
somebody over in China is making them in huge batches. They're trying to estimate what the demand's going to be. They're doing all those things. They're flying them over because they probably misread the demand and they're going to get them here quick and all those types of things. Now think about tomorrow. Tomorrow, you pick out on the internet which computer mouse you want. You send the file along with $30 or something to your local, uh, you know, 3D manufacturer or FedEx Kinko's, whatever. You send it to them. They print, they make one for you. They make one for you and it costs $30. And then either you go down and get it or some final mile truck delivers it to your house. That's a dramatic change in what these supply chains are going to look like. And for me, you know, I may never see that or actually occur, but if you're 20 years old and you're just coming into the industry, um, you're going to see that. You're going to see that. You're going to have to plan for it and, uh, and figure out how to, how to deal with that. So I think, you know, that's, a, that's an exciting piece of it. Just the whole, it's all just, it's just going to change. Um, from a concern standpoint, I think probably the biggest one, and you wrote about execution. I think execution is absolutely critical. Um, I think we are, we're kind of in a little bit of a void from an innovation standpoint, from a transportation piece. So if I think about my career, you know, I saw satellite tracking on trucks get put into place, GPS satellite tracking, a huge, huge innovation. And think about all the empty miles that got, that got eliminated by doing that. Um, so a huge opportunity there. Then I saw intermodal. And today we talk about intermodal like, well, yeah, it's a no-brainer. But I can tell you there was a time in my career where I heard one of the leading executives in the in, in the trucking industry say, I quote, we will never do business with the railroad. Never. And you know, today it's kind of like a no-brainer to do that. So there's been all these innovations, the 53-foot fan, the more productivity in one shipment, those types of things. Been a lot of innovation. We're kind of stalled a little bit right now, and we need some more of that innovation. And I just add one suggestion about this, if there's any uh, transportation companies listening to this. One of the biggest disconnects we have in transportation is the way that shippers think about cost and the way that transportation companies price are completely different. So transportation companies generally price per mile. That's what they say. Here's your cost per mile. The shippers, for the most part, could care less. What they want to talk about is cost per unit or cost per pallet or cost per whatever the thing is they're shipping. I used to tell transportation companies all the time when they'd come see me, I'm like, you charge me whatever you want as long as my cost per unit goes down. So if you can figure out how to get more in your trailer or you can design a trailer that allows me to put more things in there, my cost per unit goes down, have at it. You know, Charge me, charge me what you want as long as my cost per unit starts going down. So that one I would say is a real big nut that industry, the transportation industry has to crack. No, great, uh, uh, great insight there and uh, um, good perspective there on that last point. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of running out of time here, so I'm just going to ask my, my last question here, which I like to ask all, all of my guests, uh, particularly for any, uh, for the benefit of any students or young professionals that are listening. And, and you kind of touched upon it a little bit uh, before. Um, you know, what advice would you give to, you know, students that are right now, you know, pursuing a career in, in supply chain logistics or young professionals that are just getting started? You, you know, what should they be doing today to, you know, help them pay a, you know, a successful career down the road? Uh, I'd probably say um, if you're a student, for sure, be as quantitative as you can be. Um, uh, I think, you um, the concepts, you've got to know the concepts, you got to understand them. But I think the more you can do the mathematics of supply chain, uh, the more you'll understand it. It's not necessarily that you're going to get a job where you're sitting in front of a computer calculating things all day long. But the more you can do that, the more you'll understand what's going on with supply chain. For example, the trade off of lead time for inventory levels and free cash flow, those types of things. Those are mathematical equations that you at least have to understand the concepts behind and, and, and how that works. I think that leads me to the second one. Again, if you're a student or quite frankly, if you're not and you're just starting out, you know, understand finance. I mean, this is a finance game for the most part. This is all about cash flow. You know, if you think about what's going on in any industry, I don't care what industry it is, 
you have an outlay of cash when you're buying raw materials, and then you have to very quickly turn it into something of value and very quickly sell it to someone so that you can sell it at a reasonable price and get the cash back. And so the, it's a financial transaction all the way through. And so you have to really understand finance. And then the third thing I'd say is get your, get your hands dirty early. And, you know, we've all heard about this and, and uh, I've seen folks that will, you know, want to start in a corporate demand planning role and then go to production planning role. And then now I'm ready to be vice president of supply chain. And I think early on, what you want to be able to do is get out in the warehouse, get out in the terminal, get out in the field and really understand what's going on um, and fully understand what's going on and then start working your way up. It may look like you're not moving very fast, but I'm telling you in the long run, it'll be, it'll be very beneficial because you need that experience and you're probably not going to want to do it when you're 40. So, you know, you really get out in the field and get that and then then you can make a choice you can say hey i love operations i want to stay here i love it or you can say i now understand enough about this that i can get up to a corporate role um so those are the things i would uh, suggest great great advice kevin and uh, with that we're, we're out of time so i uh, again thank you very much for taking time uh, uh out of your schedule to be with us today kevin good thank you very much i appreciate it and uh, I want to thank everyone who joined us today. Uh, we didn't get any questions live, but if you've got any questions for Kevin or comments, uh, you can go to the uh, talkinglogistics.com website and you know post your comments there and uh, or, or questions for Kevin, and uh, you know we can keep the conversation going there. So again, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining, and remember to tune in every Thursday at noon, where we'll have uh, you know great guests like Kevin, or in some cases, I'll it'll just be me, you know, talking about you know my thoughts and perspectives on uh, you know uh, industry trends and, and topics. So with that, uh, again, thank you and have a great day. Thanks, have a great day.